Lai, the, the third proponent of the, uh, this 89 paper, who will discuss from glass to superdiffusion in an evolving cell colony. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean-Philippe is not here, but I want to thank him for uh, this one. No. Now it's on. Yeah. Um, for introducing uh, R40 in such a kind way. Um, I'm also happy uh, um, to hear Ted today because we were colleagues for 30 years and from time to time Michael would uh, force us to give uh, one of these informal statistical mechanics seminars otherwise I never heard him speak and I think it's the case that he didn't hear me speak. I think it's been very rare that we have heard each other speak so that's, that was good to hear some uh, impressive stuff that he has done and also I think that it's the case that uh, Ted, Peter, and I have never been at the same conference at the same time, as far as I know. Uh, for the last 30 years or so, you know, I've been thinking about problems uh, that are uh, relevant more to biophysics and biology. And, uh, and what struck me in this meeting was that people would start talking about a subject, and everyone knew, or, or many knew, what the starting point was. And, it's a question, I mean, for example, I never heard in the first day anyone explain what TAP stands for. And, and it's understood, you know what it stands for. But uh, when, you, when you go to biology as a, as a theorist and a, and a person doing computation, you're kind of at the bottom of the food chain and you're trying to look up to see if there are some blessings from above. And, and I could sort of explain this like this. Um, it's almost like being in an abusive relationship, but you can't break off because the person who's abusing you is so tantalizing that you go back over and over again uh, just to punish a little bit more. Um, I think in the context of protein folding, it took uh, the community at large at least over 20 years or more uh, before they started paying attention, but now I'm gonna tell you about uh, uh, some, some um, uh, thoughts on, uh, on, 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 uh, on uh, cell biology, thinking about uh, models for, uh, uh, simple models for tumor. So today I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep this on the so-called physical side, um, but we'll see how it goes. So the work was done by these, uh, uh, with these, these four guys. Uh, first, just these two, and then this graduate student joined, and then the postdoc. I'm gonna eventually tell you about the model that gives rise to this, uh, uh, computer tumor, and therefore you should only believe them as much as you believe computers. Um, and this tumor is about 0.2 millimeters, and, uh, and, and, and it's not clear, I'll get to the end of my talk, but you can already, see what's being plotted is this cross-section of the solid tumor, which is a spheroid, and, and this is, these are the velocities, velocity fields. And you can see that at the boundary, this velocity is moving in a persistent direction, and, and, and I, sh I should tell you right at the outset, we're imagining this uh, a tumor growing, pushing against a matrix, uh, and the matrix is typically an extracellular matrix or a collagen matrix, for which I'll show you some experimental results uh, through optical imaging. Uh, and, and, and the reason it can push against this collagen matrix is because uh, there, are, there are contractile forces that the cells generate, and those contractile forces are generated because underneath the machinery of each cell, uh, you're acting on myosin that cooperatively work, and, and that's how they actually crawl or move collectively. Um, last year, I was uh, in, in Weizmann for some period of time, and coincidentally, there was a meeting on cancer that was organized, and I attended only two talks. Uh, one, uh, both of them are experimental talks. One of them uh, is a guy by the name of Peter Friedel, who is a very famous guy working in Holland. He's a practicing uh, MD, and I believe his specialty is skin cancer, but he's very much interested in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in collective movements. But what I was stunned a little bit was the language that he was using to explain some of his results involved things like jamming and glasses and release, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and that sort of impressed me. Uh, that, that even these guys are learning about some aspects of it, whether or not it's relevant, I'm not sure. Um, 
my interest in this began uh, when I saw this picture. Uh, I saw uh, Tara and I found this when we were writing this uh, article about four years ago. And, and it's written, it's uh, by, uh, written principally by Nelly Poliak, who is in Dana Farber. And if you remove all these uh, uh, metastases uh, and so on and so forth, uh, and if I color them with some displacements or velocity fields, uh, you might think that I have a sample of a computer glass or something like that, like you've seen before. But in, in, and in, in fact, in this article, they use things like subclone to subclone variations. These are not Mazad's clones, but these are real clones of uh, cancers with some typical phen phenotypic uh, uh, characteristics. And, and, and this is a completely uh, important and an insol unsolved problem in treatment, because when you do biopsy, you take a small portion of the cancer, and then you devise a protocol for that, and that's what's shown here. But there are large variations within a single tumor of a single disease in a patient, which means that the responses that you give here may not be the ones that will kill the cells far away, and at time, uh, they have fitness advantage that could take over, and, and, and then eventually there's uh, metastasis which kills most people. So, in fact, in this article, we speculated uh, then that you could use some of the, some of the uh, at least the quantities that people compute uh, to figure this out, figure out something uh, associated with this. So, I, I'm going to quickly not show this. I, I'm, th these are computer simulations of 2D uh, uh, that, that, that uh, was published in this reviews. And this is another one, and this heterogeneity that we think about in these computer glasses are so-called real, they are fast and slow particles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, 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 and what I want to impress upon you is that these, in fact, can be measured in an evolving cell colony, and therefore they're not just computer uh, uh, gla uh, glasses, and, and that's what we'll see here. It turns out that the, the cancer biologists have known about heterogeneity possibly since the 50s. And this is um, an article by this person, Gloria Hepner. And the first several sentences are worth reading. She writes, in 1977, Dexter and I with colleagues Williams and the General Hospital submitted a paper to cancer research, and that's what this is taken, in which we reported the isolation of four distinct tumor subpopulations from a single spontaneously arising mouse mammary cancer. We speculated that the subpopulation was evidence for intra-neoplastic heterogeneity, and that heterogeneity was a general phenomenon, knowledge of which is important in the treatment of cancer. So a lot more important than talking about heterogeneity in, uh, in glasses. Editorial review of this manuscript, if not swift, was unambiguous. It is unworthy of publication in cancer research. Two reasons were given our results were not novel in any way. Everyone knew that cancers are monoclonal. And then she goes on to cite uh, other papers in which this is not the case, and the paper was eventually published in 1978, and this is a perspective. Of course, uh, since we're dealing with a solid tumor, um, heterogeneity takes on completely different meaning than you would in a sample of liquid or a supercooled liquid or a glass. There are obviously genetic variations, because only upon acquiring some driver mutations, which have tremendous fitness advantage of the normal cells, do you even begin to initiate cancer. Um, and then, of course, there are epigenetic modifications, modifications that take place uh, post these mutations. And, 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 uh, and there are also stochastic mechanisms that can give rise to this diversity, but underneath the stochastic mechanisms, uh, 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 there are enzymatic chemical re reactions which are in fact uh, 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 quite random uh, and can create this, uh, uh, this heterogeneity. So, so one has to worry about all of these things at some level uh, and now of course we have lots of databases where you can, within some simple models of the kind that I'll briefly describe to you, take some of this into account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a. It's, it's neither, and that's stochastic. I mean, the microenvironment of the cell uh, will determine its evolution, and and uh, you will see uh, that our model has some element of that. Okay, so we want to tell you about real things. On so the left hand side, um, I show you some uh, uh, optical image analysis of human bronchial epithelial cells. And these experiments were done and reported in Nature Materials just about four, three, four years ago. 
uh, in Dave White's and Jeff Fredberg's lab in Harvard. And what they plot, so I should say that these are monolayers. Uh, they're epithelial and confluent, which means that there are no holes in them. And, and, and they're dense, in fact. And, and these levels of water uh, really correspond to some lateral stresses that are imposed depending upon the amount of water. They wanted to argue that if I take some sort of a self-overlap function, that's one term I don't have to explain, uh, here, uh, uh, that's basically a constant. Uh, it does as a function of time. The time is measured in about 100 minutes or so. But about this 20, uh, so incidentally, our normal breathing is under three centimeters of water. And uh, how to translate that into some sort of a uh, uh, stress, uh, 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 you'll have to look it up. But at 30, though, uh, you see the overlap actually decaying. Um, and so they argued that this is an indication of something like a solid or a glass-like transition uh, to something that's fluid-like. And this is uh, uh, the fourth order something, the susceptibility associated with overlap function and tells you how much a given cell has moved in, a, uh, in some certain amount of time. And Jean-Philippe mentioned some of these uh, correlations. And, and there's a peak here, and, 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 uh, and then they've taken, because they've taken pictures, they know spatial correlations as well as temporal correlations, and the temporal correlation is of the order of 40 minutes. On the right-hand side is an extremely important process in embryogenesis, and it's called convergent extension. And, and, uh, and these are, this is a cartoon, but this is analysis of real data. And what that means is that the group of cells, uh, as they're evolving, uh, they get compressed in one direction, extend in another direction, which is necessary uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in embryogenesis. On the bottom, you see the analysis uh, that is done by a, a guy in my group, who I sh whose name I showed you before, uh, of optical images of these junctions uh, from about 15 embryos that are about 30 or so junctions. And one thing, we, we, we created a model that shows that each junction dynamics is A asymmetric, which means this contraction takes place with one of the edges that's fixed, and the other one is actually moving. And this asymmetry, in fact, is very critical. And this is taking place on a length scale of the order of microns, whereas these guys take place on a length scale that's much longer. It's more collective, and this is, in fact, individual on the length scale of one micrometers. So, and, and this is the same chi four that was calculated, and now you see the time scales over 100 seconds or so. So these are the kinds of data that are becoming available because of super resolution imaging, but you don't have tons of them. You only have a small amount, and we've got to contend with it. But, but the, uh, at least John, John Wallingford, is quite interested in the fact that this plausibly, this quote-unquote glass-like ideas are relevant in embryogenesis. All right. So I, I, I already look at the clock, and uh, I've been told that I should stop around five minutes after, so I don't have a lot of time to tell you what things I want to do. But I want to tell you that I want to give you a flavor of the kinds of scenarios that emerge when you want to see how a group of these cells, under some rules, and I hope to explain that to you pretty quickly, uh, uh, just because Daniel's already uh, uh, alerted me to that. Um, and, and, and the first scenario is this confluent tissue that I talked to you about uh, in the epithelial case. And, 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 and here, there are no cell divisions. This is two dimension. Uh, it, there's just remodeling that's going on as it's evolving. And the dynamics, in fact, can be followed uh, by optical imaging methods. The second scenario, which in fact, this is the scenario due to us. The second scenario, which is a subset of this scenario, in which there is cell division uh, at some rate and apoptosis or cell death at some rate. And, and, so, and that gives rise to a completely different kind of dynamics than before. All these, in fact, are examples. Uh, certainly, the third scenario is an example of a non equilibrium dynamics uh, because of a division and, 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 and that. And then it can use up some uh, images in, the, in, in, in people who are studying physics of active matter, but although I've never really married that idea uh, very closely. OK, so this is the kind of pictures that you get. This is, this is uh, uh, another picture from uh, uh, De Weitz and uh, uh, Fred Berg. And uh, on top, you see this, uh, this is the MDCK cells. And they've taken these images. The images don't give you the positions of all the cells. And then uh, from this, you got to go here. And there's a processing of this imaging, which is data analysis, which itself is a very interesting uh, area in which one can work. Uh, because to translate that into this picture is pretty hard. 
once you draw this, and this kind of resembles this uh, 2D simulations that I showed you before, you'll have to ascertain if there are certain cells, in fact, that are correlated in, in both space and time, and they assign some mobility, and the criterion, and these green guys are supposed to be that. And what they can vary is the density of cells on the surface, and it goes from these this numbers, and, and, and they, they can, this they can actually directly measure, and then when you plot that as a density, and there is some decrease, and they argue that there, there is a, a, a fluid-like a, a, a behavior here, and about this, this is kind of frozen, and, and this is the length scales associated with that peak, if you want, and, and, and when you plot that as a function of cell density, it does increase, in much the same way as is in glasses, but not hugely, right? It increases by a factor of three or four. Okay, so, so that's, that's, that's really what made them think about uh, uh, this as a glass. And the left-hand side uh, in the simulations came shortly afterwards uh, by Christina, uh, Lisa Manning, and, uh, and, and uh, a guy, Bo Lee, who is now in, the, in Northeastern, and they did, uh, I, I'm not gonna tell you the details of this, and this kind of looks like this if you, if you, if you uh, 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 do some coarsening of both the length and the time scales. So at that point, they're kind of convinced, uh, and that point is not too long ago, it was only about three or four years ago, uh, that what happens in an epithelial tissue, the skin is an epithelial tissue, for example, uh, there are only two kinds of possibilities as the cells migrate. One is they'll behave fluid-like, depending on the coverage. The other one, uh, it'll be uh, more solid or glass-like, uh, uh, depending uh, if you exceed some threshold. And, and, uh, uh, so I'm gonna, these are computer simulations from them, and this is a, 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 um, a, a reason that, that Lisa Manning and Markety thought that this is like a glass, this is an affected diffusion coefficient which increases precipitously at some critical value, which depends upon the energy parameters uh, in, in the system, so if you want you can go look at this. But it, I mean, then uh, this crowd may be interested in whether there's a phase transition or not, but that's not my concern. So I want to tell you about the last two things. We want to construct the minimum model uh, uh, for the cell dynamics uh, that includes a bit of biology. The minimum model is, uh, uh, let me get to that point. Now, I'm, I'm going to come back to this later. I'll show you this guy because I kind of like this movie even though it's not uh, super informative. Uh, this is a computer simulation that was done uh, in this paper in 2010 by, uh, by Frank Ulicher, Jacques Perrault, uh, and uh, I'm afraid my good friend Jean-François Jean Giovanni. And they actually showed that unlike the scenario that I told you about, there's only two possibilities that in an epithelial tissue of a glass, they, sh they argue that whenever you have homeostasis, which means the birth and the death rates become equal, the only possibility is it's going to be fluid-like and nothing else can happen. You cannot, and, and, and that's what they showed, both theoretically uh, and, and using computer simulation. The scenario three that we considered was the following. We were completely naive then, only epsilon more or less naive now. And, and so we wanted to create a model uh, that takes some kind of short range interactions between cells into account. And we know what they are. Uh, the cells could repel each other because there are after all elastic objects that are squishy and fluctuating. But on top of them, they also stick together because your, your, your development, in fact, depends upon that. And, and that's because uh, they have something called e cadherin which is a protein which, uh, which uh, 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 joins to, 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 to uh, and there are many of them expressed on the cell surface depending upon how, what the area of the cell is. Um, and that's the idea of interaction. And the only place biology comes in here is we, we, we said that the cells can grow and when they reach a mitotic radius, a division radius, uh, and they would divide. And our cells also can undergo apoptosis. So within this, there are only, essentially, if you fix this guy, and this contains about a few couple of parameters, any short range interaction will do. There are only two other parameters that come to the problem, which sense the local microenvironment in a way that I need to explain. Oh, so the experiments that I want to chase are this. Uh, which was published about four years ago, which the referee pointed out to us exists, uh, confirming some of the things we were talking about. And, and, uh, and they, what, this is, this is uh, fibrosarcoma, uh, some cell number. Uh, it's a spheroid that's pushing against the collagen matrix. And what they can monitor 
is image some cells. In fact, they can image over 150 cells, it turns out. And they can also see how the growth actually uh, occurs as you go from the center. So you introduce the cell at day zero, and that's about, uh, I don't know, half a micron or so. This is day three. They followed this uh, uh, dynamics till day five. On, on, day, on day five, they uh, 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 did a two-dimensional imaging and, uh, and because they had certain cells marked with GFP uh, and, and uh, about 150 cells uh, uh, before any further cell division can occur. This cell divides in about once per day or once in 21, 21 hours, and the measurement of the optical imaging was done over a period of eight hours. Okay, so that's what they do. What did they find? And, and this is uh, real images. In fact, we now have the trajectories from them in our hands, and we're, and we're looking at them sort of quite closely. And they find cells that move very fast, and that's what they're supposed to be, and the cells that move slowly. Uh, this is like dynamic heterogeneity all over again. And when you plot the mean square displacement average over everyone, uh, what they found is that it increases uh, faster than uh, linearly, which means uh, that this behavior is super diffusive. Okay. Um, I can't afford to show you all this. So let me tell you uh, the model a little bit more. Uh, the model uh, is a quote-unquote realistic model. The, the elastic uh, uh, aspect of it was borrowed from uh, stuff that uh, Hertz did, uh, I think, nearly two centuries ago, I think. And, and then there's a, there's a model for the adhesive interactions, which is also short range. And the parameters in the model, and not that it makes a difference for my uh, arguments here, shows a minimum. Uh, that means the cells for this particular ligand concentration of E cadherin as a minimum and can resist forces of the order of 10 to 20 piconewtons. And there are single cell pulling experiments. You can calibrate that. So there's a lot of work that goes on in constructing this short range guy who won't play a huge amount of role. So here's the microenvironment sex sensing. So we have one other dynamic rule. And the dynamic rule is that if I consider some cell, and uh, the neighboring cells are exerting some pressure on this, and, and we have this dormancy threshold, if that pressure exceeds some critical value, we say that cell becomes dormant, which means it cannot participate in the dynamics. But a cell that's dormant at one time can not be so later on, depending on the rearrangements that take place. This dormancy criterion with a threshold provides a mechanical feedback that limits the growth of the cells. Uh, and you can sort of appreciate this. So if this critical, critical dormancy threshold is infinite, say, that means no cell will ever become dormant. Then you would expect that the growth of this column, even is pushing in the matrix, will grow exponentially in time. And that, of course, is ridiculous. Likewise, when this PC, the threshold is 0, uh, 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 that means all of them are going to remain dormant, and that's also something that does not happen biologically. And this idea that there's some threshold, and this is measurable, it turns out, in tumors, acting as a feedback, was pointed out in a very nice paper by Boris Schreiman uh, about four years ago. So then the rules are, uh, this is the uh, way the cell grows, preserving volume, and what comes in this growth law is the cell doubling time. So we have this cell doubling time, some death rate and the species parameters for a given short range interaction, which can itself be altered by, by changing the density of, uh, of uh, cadherence on the, on, the, on, the, on the membrane surface. Okay, I'm not going to. So, this, I, so I, I'll tell, the scenario two is, in fact, a, a special uh, limit of this scenario. If you assume that your death rate does depend upon, and this is a little bit like what Daniel was saying uh, is related to the birth rate, uh, uh, then at long times, uh, if it's related this way, uh, at very long time, uh, you're going to have homeostasis where the death, death and birth, in fact, balance. And at that time, uh, if you calculate the mean square displacement, it's simply diffusive. And this is a result that, uh, that, um, that uh, Johnny and uh, the others got uh, uh, already 10 years ago. So, so, but for the model in which the death and birth are imbalanced, so the birth rate is, is uh, greater than the death rate, uh, and you can vary that. Uh, the mean square displacement, in fact, shows a slight plateau or a caging effect, as the glass people might call it, but at very long time, it becomes super diffusive, 
uh, here it's subdiffusive and here it's superdiffusive and the and and in this particular case uh, the, uh, the exponent is about 1 1.3 uh, 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 but this is not universal or something like that one of the things I've gotten over uh, is uh, we, we obsessed with exponents uh, and in this case uh, uh, that is in fact the right thing to do um, so uh, this basic I showed you this before uh, and this number is not so horribly different from uh, uh, what is measured in the uh, uh, sphere order by an collagen. You can work out a theory, and I only show this just because we're celebrating Giorgio. Um, uh, 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 because of this birth and death, uh, I mean, there are some standard machineries in which you can follow the uh, um, um, uh, density of the collective movement uh, uh, and it's subject to some noise and uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is not valid and that is also the case in a related problem that uh, Ramin Golastanian uh, looked at uh, yes um, uh, looked at and and uh, and it turns out that you know, you can work out some things associated with this uh, uh, using a method that uh, Giorgio Parisi and uh, and this guy I don't know how and I don't know you know this journal uh, 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 maybe it doesn't exist anymore I don't know so if you, if you use that and, and use some scaling relations, you can actually show uh, that the uh, intermediate time, uh, it, it goes as 4 fifth. At long time, it's 4 third. This is not so good. And that's because the theory doesn't take into account this microenvironment that you can become dormant when things uh, exceed uh, uh, some pr pressure threshold. All right, these are all not so relevant, not so relevant. I wanna, so, so I want to show you this velocity heterogeneity. Uh, this is a movie that was generated by this woman who works for TAC, TAC stands for Texas Advanced Computing Center or something like that. And, and you can see um, that, that if we're just cutting through the cross section and it's playing too fast, but you can see that there's uh, the velocity heterogeneous exists. In fact, the velocity between the periphery and the interior changes by about four orders, nearly four, four orders of magnitude. Okay, um, um, this is a preliminary analysis of the 150 cell uh, images, uh, trajectories that we got from uh, uh, this person in Johns Hopkins who did that experiment on the uh, uh, Anka target. And uh, we now know what the interior is, what the periphery is. We can calculate the diffusion constant as a function of that radial distance. And you can see that the velocity autocorrelation function uh, 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 is essentially zero uh, uh, in the interior. Uh, it's kind of like uh, highly dense liquid jammed in fact and 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 and, uh, and whereas in the periphery it persists and this persistence is needed for this colony to keep growing in in, one, in the radial direction um, uh, uh, and and one can you and then but you see there's a huge amount of dispersion which means each cell uh, uh, behaves completely differently uh, from the others uh, you can even imagine constructing things like uh, Edward Anderson order parameter, but, but there's no replica symmetry breaking, uh, I am sure. Uh, all right, um, I, I think that um, uh, this is a little bit uh, newer topic, and, and uh, um, uh, for this audience, what I want to tell you is that uh, 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 not me telling you this, but Peter Friedel telling you is a practicing MD, uh, and, 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 and he, he's, he's a surprising manifestations of physics and physical chemistry of, of uh, and the physical chemistry part is important because uh, one has to worry about reactions as well that we have not take that we are and, and our mutations we're in the process of taking that into account of the liquid to gas transition concepts. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, questions? The dead cells are removed, uh, and they wash away essentially. In, 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 in real cells, they're cleared. And, and so it's, it's the same thing here, they're cleared. They go away, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 there's a technical point, I, 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 let me not get into it, yeah. They don't poof go away, they go away with some time. Poof is not good because it causes some discontinuities that you don't want to deal with. Yeah. I was wondering 
it, it is. I mean, it uh, affects uh, the, the local microenvironment, which means those that are alive and those that are growing to give birth or divide are affected by that. And so that's, that's, in, that's, that's both dynamically in the model and as well as so in the interactions. I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, biofilms is, uh, it, 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 let me make a more general comment than just biofilms. The, 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 uh, the model, as you see, is very simple. And therefore, you can adapt it. For example, we're in the process of reading genetic mutations into, this, in, into the cells. So really look at the phenotypic uh, changes that take place as a colony evolves. And uh, one can easily adapt this for uh, biofilms as well. But, uh, uh, but we haven't done that. and, 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 and you know, I only have some bandwidth that I can think about some problems. So yeah, it's, it's just, just for one last question. Yeah, easy. Yeah, uh, so actually there was some work in biofilms about the growth, which, yeah. which motivates my question. So is because in biofilm there is a signal to grow on the surface, Correct. to grow less yeah. inside. Is there yeah. similar signals to the cells in terms of mechanical perturbation, nutrients, whatnot, yeah. for them to divide faster when they see less neighbors, yeah. Whatever, yeah. when they feel that they're yeah. in the interior? Yeah, but that's here also actually, uh, uh, it, because the the they would become quickly dormant if they, were, uh, they, they had too many neighbors, and then rearrangement basically stops. So it does feel that as well. But you raise a, a question that, that 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 we have addressed in the in the paper, namely, uh, uh, what about the angiogenic capacity of these cells, and and uh, and that that gives you an additional layer of complexity, which of course allows you to go closer uh, to what, what the cancer biologists are thinking about, but, but I didn't want to get into it here. Yeah. Okay, maybe let's thank uh, Dave again.